Good, let's get started. It's always a little tricky when one group has to come out and the other one coming in and so on. Anyway, welcome. My name is John Christensen. I'm the director of something called the UNEP DTU Partnership, a collaborating center of the UN Environment Program. And we've been managing the process of producing this adaptation gap report. And my colleague Anne will present it a little later on. And uh, I think just in terms of context, I mean, we've been doing, and I hope many of you have seen and read, the emission gap report for a number of years, actually started after the Copenhagen Cup, and uh, had a lot of interest and traction from countries and all kinds of other areas for that. So we were asked to see if it was possible to do something similar on the adaptation side. And of course, you don't have an easy common metric on the adaptation side, like the emission gap in terms of looking at global emissions and so on. So we did a first scoping report on the adaptation gap in the, presented in Lima and trying to look at both technology and finance and information and so on to try and see what kind of logical gaps could you talk about and had a good discussion about that at the time. And then after that, it was decided that the one we will hear about now, the second unit adaptation gap report should focus on finance and, and really look at the understanding of what you could call the gap between what's available right now and what the needs are. And none of that is probably very easy to define either the current amount or what is needed. But that's why you have all these nice people up here to tell you something about that. And uh, I think before moving on with the panel, I'll just ask Olga to say welcome on behalf of the Secretariat because this is kind of a joint event together with UNIP and the Secretariat. Olga, please. Work? Okay. Thank you very much, John. Um, yes, uh, as you said, uh, building uh, on the 2014 um, Adaptation Gap Report, uh, this new report zooms in the, um, the likely costs of meeting adaptation needs in developing countries now in the, in the future and finance available and required to meet these costs. And um, I must say from our side, it's this report appears as a very um, appropriate and right time as we are now in the, uh, build, at the building phase of the implementation of the Paris Agreement, uh, which is for the first time gives um, a common direction of measuring vulnerability and defining adaptation actions uh, by establishing a global adaptation goal and linking this goal, which is important, to the temperature goal of the Paris Agreement, which you probably know by heart now, uh, to limit global average temperature increase to well below two degrees, and um, the aspiration or the, the, the decision language says pursuing efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees. This framing providing um, you know, this framing provided, provides more certainty for our future vulnerability assessments and adaptation action planning and um, provides a destination to where we want to go to be in terms of emission reduction and also gives direction to future methodological work to um, uh, adaptation. Uh, the UNEP gap, gap report and this regard is a very important uh, as it initiates and helps future uh, uh, helps further explore a variety of methodological approaches for assessments of such complex and critically important matter as finance for adaptation. This also hopefully helps um, to better direct our efforts towards the implementation of the key provisions of the Paris Agreement. I will speak a little bit in more detail about the methodological tasks and challenges that we have from the Paris Agreement at the panel. But this time I just wanted to highlight the relevance of this uh, work and this report uh, to the uh, uh, global goal for, uh, for adaptation. Another most important feature um, a, a, for, of this report that compared to the previous one is that it takes into account of the INDCs, um, Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, for those who are not familiar with this term, uh, which is the very rich source for um, analysis on current state of adaptation um, implementation and associated needs. 137 parties uh, submitted an adaptation component on their INDCs, 
which is uh, um, considered that it's fairly representative uh, in particular for, uh, for the adaptation actions on developing countries. Um, with regard to financing, most parties provided information on finance needs in this report and uh, for in the INDCs, and uh, it's, it's uh, captured a lot in the report. Um, and uh, several parties quantified their adaptation finance needs and expressed um, them either the total sum of the implementation period, and it's the figure ranging from 100 million to more than 200 billion. Um, and several included how they're using domestic resources and proportions of domestic finance and the total support needs um, they highlighted um, in, the, in some NDCs. Um, given that uh, the COP didn't provide any guidance for including uh, elements for support in the INDCs, and I mean, by itself, it was a controversial matter to rather uh, or whether to include these figures on, or not um, under the negotiations. The information is not um, easily comparable. Uh, for example, some refer to economy-wide needs, while others refer to sectors or projects, some uh, implementation of INDCs, others refer to adaptation needs as a whole, and some describe the needs for entire adaptation component, while others provide some annual estimates. So there's uh, obviously, it's clear that it's still work to be done, and it's a lot of work to be done to bring everyone on the same page and to see uh, what uh, methodologies, in terms of methodologies, as well as information as it communicated. And this report uh, demonstrated, I uh, repeat, that there is a wide opportunity for future methodological work that has a great potential to uh, contribute valuable information and to build a phase of the implementation <clears throat> of the Paris Agreement. Finally, I would like to congratulate you, more than us, <laughs> on the, um, for this excellent effort. And then we are looking forward um, to collaborating with you in the future uh, report and refining the findings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alka, for a very nice framing of the event. And, and I think maybe two things that I didn't do properly in the beginning is one is, of course, to introduce Alka, who's manager of the cross-cutting support and outreach sub-program here at the Secretariat. And before she was fully occupied with that, she was also writing on adaptation. There's a more scientific engagement. I don't think you have time to do that anymore. Uh, the other part is, is that we are actually on uh, YouTube also. So just so you know that any questions that are coming up, it, there's no pictures. <laughs> The, the slides will go up and whatever we say will be broadcast live. And I'm told there's a Twitter account also where you can actually ask questions. And uh, if you're really keen, I'll tell you, but otherwise I'd rather have you ask questions when, <laughs> when I ask you too, because I was in here on Friday and, and very few people ask questions verbally, which is much more fun than getting them in print. Mm -hmm. But let's get back to that. And uh, and then it's striking. I was doing the same thing Friday evening. The same thing is like school class, nobody likes to sit on the front row. Everybody is down at <laughs> the back end, and I can understand that you want to be able to get out, but you shouldn't, because this has got to be fun and interesting. Good. So let's move on. And I think the first one is, is Anne, who will give you an overview and introduction to the to the report and its findings, and then afterwards we will hear from some people who have either been involved in it, worked on it before, or kind of live with its consequences. I'll say. So Anne, please. Anne is heading our Resilient Development Program at UDP in Copenhagen. So Anne, please. Thank you, John. And thank you, Olga, also for framing re the report very nicely in, in the context of the Paris Agreement, which is, which is also something we took advantage of in, in, the, in light of the fact that we uh, published it after, after the Paris Agreement. So it's a great pleasure to be here today to present to you some of the key findings of, the, of this new uh, Adaptation Finance Gap Report. Uh, that we launched at the Adaptation Futures Conference a few weeks ago. It's a joint effort uh, by 25 authors from 15 different institutions across, uh, across the world. It's been uh, overseen by a steering committee, uh, including the use of NASEF, who's, who couldn't be here today. And it's undergone two uh, rounds of external review uh, in the process. 
So here I'd like to show you some of the main questions and also like very short answers to those questions that the report presents. So first of all, and it also represents the structure of the presentation. First of all, the, the, the report looks into the likely cost of meeting adaptation needs in developing countries. It looks at how much finance is currently flowing towards <laughs> adaptation. And then com comparing the two looks at what is the likely adaptation finance gap now and in the future. So we look at currently, we focus on 2030 and then look towards 2050. And then finally, it includes some section on how can we possibly bridge the gap, which also relates it to the, to the Paris Agreement. So starting with the cost of adaptation, basically the, the report reconfirms the uh, findings of the first unit of adaptation, adaptation gap report that, uh, pre that current estimates of, of the cost of adaptation in developing countries, and I should be saying this report focuses on undeveloping countries, uh, that are currently reported and were also cited in the fifth assessment report by the IPCC of costs of around 70 to 100 billion US dollars per year uh, for the period covering 2010 to 2050 are likely to be underestimates. And why is that? Well, it's basically because uh, previous est estimates provide partial coverage, both of sectors and of risks. They generally don't consider uncertainty and um, and they uh, also many of them build on the assumptions that mitigation will be very successful in, in limiting uh, global warming to below two degrees. So in line with also with the previous reviews and critiques, uh, the report finds that by 2030, these costs could be two to three times higher the earlier estimates. So up, and up, up, to, up to 300, uh, 300 billion US dollars per year. And if we look further into the future, towards 2050, the cost of adaptation could be even higher than that, up to four to five times higher. And this is because the assessment builds on a much more detailed um, analysis and assessment of, of studies, not only global studies, but also studies of adopting a more bottom-up approach, looking, looking at sectors and, um, and national level studies. They also tend to, um, to include uh, greater coverage of risks in sectors, they have more realistic assumptions about the cost of implementation of adaptation on the ground and so forth. And that also means that part of the costs covered in these estimates will probably be more development costs and adaptation costs, but the two are so closely interlinked that it's really difficult also to separate them in, in any uh, convincing way. But we like to emphasize, and what I know that Paul Watt is one of the lead authors of the cost chapter, would like me to emphasize is that we cannot come up with any single cost estimate of, of, um, for adaptation. And what is provided much, much more, in much more detail in the report is that the cost estimates vary very strongly with the assumptions made with methodology use and, and, the, and the principles underlying the assumptions in general. What the report also analyzes and illustrates is that uh, enhanced mitigation action is, is the best insurance of, against uh, incredibly large uh, adaptation costs. And really that is the first best option of reducing the, the costs and needs for adaptation in the future. Then we also see that uh, improvement has been happening in terms of cost estimates and in, in terms of studies. There are many new studies around. Um, and that coverage of sectors has gradually improved as well, but also that there's still major gaps. Uh, where sectors such as water and agriculture are covered quite comprehensively, the same is not the case if we look, for instance, at industry, uh, energy, and also um, ecosystems, where it's much more difficult to provide solid estimates. Turning to adaptation finance, as you all know, there are basic four basically four sources of finance. It can be domestic and it can be international and it can be either public and private uh, finance. Currently, the only thing that we can really give you a comprehensive number of is, is the international public adaptation finance. And luckily we have Barbara here on the panel who, who knows a lot about this in, in very much detail. And that also means that the numbers in the reports, the estimates presented are underestimating total finance flowing towards adaptation because we cannot include domestic finance and we cannot include private finance. 
and there's a clear need to to establish better da data to get a more credible uh, picture of the of the size of the domestic public adaptation finance although it is improving as Katja also mentioned there's information in the INDCs and there are generally some studies at, at, at country level that do provide some estimates then we look more into details regarding private sector financing for adaptation and it's uh, it's it's very difficult to track what the report finds is that it's likely to pay to to be able to to play a key role but um, but and especially if we look at the domestic private finance Turning to what we can actually say something about the international public adaptation finance flows, we see that in 2014 these reached a total of around 25 US, US, a billion US dollars, of which 22.5 flowed to uh, developing countries. This also represents, as you can see from the graph up there, of the figure, a steady, a steady increase over the past five years. So a very positive story. Also, if you look in terms of, of adaptation and how it's in mainstreamed into development assistance, you see the same picture and increasing trends towards, incre towards mainstreaming adaptation into development. If we look specifically at the adaptation-focused climate funds, uh, these have also increased very much over the past 10 years, but are still very limited uh, in terms of the total finance flowing to to, uh, to uh, developing countries. But what we do see is both the, the general inc increase, but also that there has been in, an increase in terms of um, in terms of funds approved for disbursement. So that's 76% of these resources were actually approved for disbursement by the end of uh, 2015. The report also finds that dedicated climate funds play a very important role in terms of breaking down barriers to investment and also that they can catalyze other adaptation-related investments. Furthermore, what's interesting also in terms of private finance perspective, more and more of the, of the development finance institutions actually start reporting on the, the private sector investments mobilized through, through, through the public sector investments. So summing up, we can see that developed country contributions to adaptation-targeted funds remain low if we compare to mitigation-targeted funds. It also, it's also clear that improved tracking and reporting is important also in terms of ensuring that, uh, that finance is uh, used efficiently and also that it flows to the areas and the countries where it's most needed. And then, as I said, public finance can help mobilize domestic private investment. But what is really crucial here is, is the incentive structures and the policies in place in the country. If we turn to the adaptation finance gap, I think from what I've already presented, it becomes pretty clear that there's likely to be a gap between the likely cost of adaptation and the finance available for meeting, meeting those needs and costs. And we look at the adaptation finance gap as the difference between this, these two. And I'm going to show you a figure now that's also in the report that basically illustrates how the adaptation finance gap could develop. Uh, and it shows you for now, for 2030 and for 2050. And as, as I said before, we don't have the full picture of, of finance flowing to adaptation. So basically what this figure does is to compare the likely, the estimates of the cost of adaptation to the orange boxes, which is basically current uh, international public ad adaptation finance flows. And then for 2030 and 2050, we also, for comparison, uh, introduce a $50 billion target, which is basically assuming that the uh, $100, $100 million pledge is, is implemented and that funds are distributed equally to adaptation and mitigation. So what does this figure show us? It shows us that already now adaptation costs are likely to be two to three times higher than, than the current uh, international public finance going to adaptation. Oops, the wrong button. And that if we look at 2030 and assume that, um, I'll just compare it to current international adaptation funding, uh, costs would be three to six times higher than, ha than half this $100 billion goal and six to 13 times higher than current international public finance. 
Looking towards 2050, it becomes more and more uncertain what we, we don't really know what the, what the finance picture will look like, but if we just compare to current flows and, and the $50, 50, $50 billion uh, total, we see that adaptation costs will be much, much higher and the gap will be higher. So concluding today, developing countries already face an adaptation finance gap. And this gap is likely to grow substantially over the coming de decades, unless we make significant progress in terms of securing new and additional finance, and also in terms of enhancing the ambition uh, in terms of mitigation. Because what the report finds is actually that as we look towards 2030 and towards 2050, the mitigation action now will actually have an implication for the costs of adaptation and for the gap. Finally, the report turns to how can we bridge the adaptation finance gap. And as Olga mentioned, the Paris Agreement provides some very important, a very important framework for advancing on adaptation. It establishes a global goal for adaptation. We all know that that is very qualitatively termed in the Paris Agreement. But also that the INDCs provided a lot of good information and more specific information information and suggestions in terms of targets and goals for adaptation at the national level and sectoral level. It also restates the commitment to increase developed country party funding flowing to, to developing countries and as, as this report shows this is absolutely absolutely crucial. And then the request uh, for parties to draw up and update regularly adaptation plans and strategies is very important and it also relates to what this report shows that there is a need to enhance methodologies and approaches uh, for doing so. What do we need to bridge the adaptation finance gap? Three areas seem particularly important based on the findings of this report. First of all, it's, uh, it's imperative that we reduce adaptation needs through enhancing mitigation ambition and also the, in, and the cost of adaptation in general which can also, you know, one strategy that, that clearly needs to be pursued very comprehensively is, is to look at climate resilient development and of integrating adaptation into general development. It's also clear that all sources of finance needs to be scaled up. And as the, the figures of this report shows, we cannot rely on international public uh, adaptation finance only. We need to bring all sources of finance into play. And then finally, what the report doesn't look so much into, but what of course is absolutely crucial is that this is not just a matter of having finance available. It has to be spent right, it has to flow to the right places, it has to ensure the greatest impact. Um, and what we generally conclude in the report is that as part of the implementation of the Paris Agreement, action in each of these areas can be, can be driven. So, Ending the presentation with a quote from the INDC submitted by the Gambia, the cost of doing nothing now will be astronomical in the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, for a quite brief, but still sort of comprehensive in its own way. But if you've seen all the work going into it, it's, it's really a very brief summary of a lot of work. I think, before we go to the panel, that we can take some either direct questions or comments, if you have one. Yes, it's nice to have the first one right away. So I think we have this uh, interesting little microphone thing which goes around the room. I don't know where it went. It's actually a big box. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it's, it's more for the fun of it, actually, because it's... <laughs> and you can throw it. Oh, I can throw it. You can throw it I if somebody yeah, wants to catch. I'm going to hit somebody in the head. <laughs> and you, you just speak into the dark blue or black or whatever it is. Um, hello, thank you. Um, I just was wondering whether you'd be able to give us an idea, very roughly speaking, um, to what extent are the estimates of adaptation costs based purely on the broad scale implementation of hard, grey, engineered um, solutions? seawalls, levees, irrigation channels, that sort of thing, versus much more, much more cost-effective, much cheaper nature-based solutions, ecosystem-based adaptation and so forth. There's a range of figures given there, 300 to 500 billion, and I'm just wondering to what extent that range might reflect um, a division of effort between those two types of approaches. Thank you. 
should take one or two more and then we take them together. So if you can sort of, I don't know, nobody can get the idea. I, I learned it on Friday that you can actually throw it and hopefully somebody will catch it, even if it hits the ground. Is this, is this the mic? Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. I'm Razu from Nepal. Well, I just have uh, two quick questions, actually. Uh, one is, when you were doing the analysis for the, the cost analysis for the adaptation, were you also looking into the aspect of loss and damage? Does that come into uh, um, in the perspective or not? How have you considered that part? Or that is something additional you would do it in, in, in the future? The other one is like you have, you have, you have also looked into the uh, long-term thing about like 2030, 2050. Um, I'm just wondering like, um, have you also given, a, I, I, since I've not read the report, have you also given uh, any recommendation that in the, in the, as a pathways of reaching to that gap, how do you meet that gap and how, how the flow should be there? Is there anything, uh, numbers on that part? Thank you. Good, there's one more. Yeah, just here. This is a, oh, it's like thank a oh, this yeah, is not the I've microphone, seen, is it? Is it? No. Yeah, just talk into the dark one. Okay. I believe uh, it's well. gonna happen, it will. Um, yes, thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Um, my first question, Raju already took up on loss and damage, if that's included in the estimated costs. Um, I mean, because sometimes loss and damage is seen as part of adaptation, which I think is maybe flawed, but anyway, so that's a, one question. The second question is on the numbers. Um, because you compared, I mean, you said we already at 22.5 billion a year for adaptation. That includes uh, not only international support, but it also includes um, loans counted at face value so some of that goes back so that isn't really so assistance going into countries but some of it will come out back as repayment of loans and it also includes um, projects where climate is only one of many objectives um, so does that also mean that the your estimate for the costs now and in the future also includes the costs that only partially cover adaptation i mean how do you compare these numbers uh, because if you look only at district what's really specific for adaptation then the numbers are much lower, which makes the picture even starker, of course, at the gap that we have. Thanks. Good. Thanks. I think, yeah, I, I've seen the hands. I think we'll stop because some of the questions are quite technical details. I think if we put too many in one row, then it might be difficult to catch all of them. We'll come back. I have a second round, then we'll come back to the panel because Barbara has to leave five to four. So we want to make sure that we get her up and, and uh, give her idea about how we deal with the questions for the panel. So Anne, please. I'll take the first, or try to reply to the first first question uh, first, uh, regarding whether it only included the more hard options or not, and whether that was related to the low and higher bounds of the cost estimates. The, the very short answer is, is no. It does not only include seawalls and other hard construction uh, adaptation measures, and the the width, or you can say the sort of the range of costs really reflects that uh, the, the estimates are highly influenced by the underlying assumptions. And there's a very good discussion in the report. And I should also say that we have copies of the report. You're welcome to take one. Um, so so of, of why estimates differ. And it's not mainly because of, of, of the coverage of adaptation measures. It's it's really the underlying assumptions in, in general that influence the, the, the range of estimates. On the loss and damage, no, we don't look much into loss and damage at all. Actually, it was a very deliberate decision by the steering committee to keep this apart from the loss and damage uh, discussion. You can say that in the cost chapter, as it also deals a little bit with residual damage, which is then basically what is loss and, loss and damage part of it, it, it sort of touches upon it, but we don't include an, an active um, assessment of, of uh, loss and damage. Um, then you were asking whether we provide some kind of pathway for bridging the gap if we look over time. Not directly, but what the report really illustrates is that unless we address current gaps, the current development gaps, the current adaptation gaps and deficits, if those are not addressed now, then the gap will, will increase and, and basically the ability of countries to respond to the needs and, and reduce vulnerability and increase climate resilience in the future is going to be jeopardized. So in that sense, it does, um, it does reflect on it. There's also a rather short section that deals more about what actions and what is the, the sort of time frame which actions should be undertaken first to, to address the gap. So it, it does, but, but we don't have any scenarios or 
or assumptions or modeling of, of uh, assumptions about that. Then, and I'm very happy also to have Barbara here. You're welcome to add to to this last question or the the answer to it. You're quite right that the 22.5 is not is not grants. I can't remember the exact percentage of grants. Was it 17? 72? Is it? Okay. Um, but it also includes <laughs> concessional loans and, and, and loans, so in that sense. But it does have a very detailed, and Barbara can tell you much more about that. We only look at, um, at finance that has a specific um, and primary objective of, of adaptation, and a lot of uh, detail has gone into disentangling the development components. Barbara, maybe you want to add to that? Yeah. Excellent question. And just to add, yeah, we are actually in that context very much looking at the components. So we are like following the, the approach from the MDB group uh, who are not counting the whole project as adaptation, but really specific parts of it as adaptation. Again, we are depending on the data that we are able to track from other sources as we've not been tracking ourselves apart from the MDBs, but we are actually really managing to go by transaction by transaction to look into what's behind the flows. Uh, and so, so we are trying to do our best to re reflect what is really going towards, where possible, what is going towards adaptation. You are right that we are obviously in the context of the donor funding, we are depending on the OECD data, where there is um, a little less detail than in the context of the, the MDD data, where there is a, a much more kind of uh, granular information. But at the same time, we are trying really to kind of also confront and verify some of this data there. So in that sense, you can, they are comparable in terms of what they're trying to, to measure, currently at least. Could we have one more? I think we will have maybe just the one. Did anybody else have the hands up? Because as I said, we'd like to make sure we can hear what Barbara has to say. Okay, thank you. Um, Tracy from Oxfam. Um, so when I saw the media stuff around this report, the main thing that was highlighted was the 500 2050 billion number and because of that I assumed that the 2030 number was also the same as in the 2014 report so the 2014 report estimated adaptation costs to be around 150 billion was the number but now you've said uh, the range is between 140 and 300 billion so actually you know that's quite a big difference um, I wondered if you could explain the difference. I mean, do you use a different assumption in terms of temperature? Is it just that you've understood the picture a lot better and it's more expensive? Thanks, Tracy. Actually, we, it is it is the same. It they are the same, same. numbers okay. as in the 2014 report. But what we didn't do in the 2014 report, partially also because, you know, the authors said the important is that the sort of the the magnitude and 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 the factor, but but not so much the number itself, because we cannot come up with any true number of the, the cost of adaptation. But the first report did actually also say two to three times current uh, estimates uh, by 2030, which would which would you know provide the range of 140 to 300,000 to 300 by 2030. So it's the same same numbers. What was anyway, that? I'll ask after. Sorry. Yes. The, the, the shorthand we've always used as NGOs is 150 billion. That was our takeaway. So we were perhaps wrong to. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Not from the report. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are more. Anne will be here also when we finish. But I want to make sure that we make use of our panel up here. So uh, thank you a lot, Anne. And we move on with. And I'm still fascinated by the question, so I hope that, that they will actually answer it, which is how to operationalize and implement the Paris Agreement to achieve the global goal and adaptation, national and global perspectives. And if you can answer that question in 10 minutes, <laughs> then I think everybody here will be happy and can maybe not go home, but, but at least sort of think about something else. So first it's Barbara, Barbara Buchner. She's from the Climate Policy Initiative, where she's the executive director for their finance program. So Barbara, please, and, and she has to leave, so we, We'll take a quick question on her when she's finished, if we can manage to do that, Barbara. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, I certainly won't answer the, the question fully. I think what I would like to focus on a little bit more is how can we really help to scale up the money going towards adaptation? And based on the work we've been doing, 
really trying to understand, uh, you know, how can we really meet the needs that are out there and that by, uh, you know, blending most effectively the available public resources uh, with private resources, both international and domestic ones. And we do think that, you know, the numbers that um, Ange has shown uh, that are an uncertain estimate what's out there at the moment just because of many difficulties still related to accounting approaches to boundaries of what is development what is adaptation where do you really cut the line but also because there is still big uncertainties around you know uh, specific you know flows from domestic budgets from the private sector where we know that there are investments but we don't know exactly how much because there is no comprehensive data sources so but nonetheless even though we while we do think that our number is the, the lower bound, the 25 global, 25 billion US dollars global flows. We think it's the lower bound. We still are far from, you know, far we're falling far short from the needs that are out there in order to, to really get us on a kind of resilient pathway. So we have been trying to understand a little bit better how we can incentivize the private sector to come in. And uh, first of all, in order to understand that, you know, what are the current barriers that are keeping private actors uh, from actually investing in resilient activities in adaptation finance, as we call it here. And we've come up with three uh, groups of uh, gaps or barriers. Um, and the first one being basically policy gaps. So the regulatory framework in the country is just not right for investors to come in. They might be either uncertain, they might, you know, have been lots of retroactive changes, but it might be also just that the standards, the codes, are not right in order to really make the, the, the investment. So that really is coming back to the operations of the Paris Agreement, obviously a very big signal that, you know, make sure, continue the work that has been done up to now to build the capacity, build the policy environment in the country. Because once the enabling environment is right, then investment will follow. And um, so that is the first one. The second uh, gap is around knowledge and awareness. So we still know that lots of the opportunities particularly around adaptation investments, are not well known, also by like the domestic private sector, uh, but that there is also very often the risks or the vulnerabilities um, that arise from climate change on their own assets from investors uh, are again not well, very well known. So in order to ensure that the investment decisions actually take this information into account, you really got to make sure that the information is available, that people truly know what's the impact of climate change on their own assets and really making sure that they have the tools, that business has the tools actually to, to you know, incorporate the risks into their day-to-day -day business decisions. And then I think the third part is around what we call the, the funding risk and revenue gap. So certainly we know particularly in the context of adaptation finance that there is an issue of having access to funding in country and really making sure that they're you know, also the, the private sector, you know, that their local financial institutions are actually aware of, of the opportunities uh, and of the, you know, do have an understanding of, of how they can provide specific financial instruments uh, for more resilient um, technologies. And at the same time, we, we got to make sure that also that there is less uncertainties around the revenues of some of these investments, which continue to be uh, very high, uh, as are the perceived risks around some of these investments. And again, I think it is about understanding what are the risks that the private sector can take and where is it that the public sector, we need to use the public sector money or resources policies in order to take these risks off. And so in that third context, what we see is very important and we are working on that and I know many others room as well, is about innovating to both develop or refine financial tools or instruments that can really make sure that, um, that the risks and the returns are right and that you're really creating you know, some, some concrete uh, investment opportunities for private investors to come in using public seed funding most effectively to kind of, you know, get them into the country and really transform the economies by really building the, the in-country and, you know, the, the local financial institutions that have an understanding how to do that. So I think that's kind of the three overall points that I did want to make. Um, um, just what we see is, is really, you know, again, governments can adjust the regulatory frameworks very important, you know, you can, governments, but also financial institutions, as they're already doing is, can equip um, businesses with the tools and the information so that there is a more better informed decision making. But then we still need to understand also from the experiences um, of current funds and, you know, lots of donors and, you know, MDBs who are trying to do that. And we've been working a lot with 
a group of um, uh, development finance institutions who have been pioneering some ways of public private partnerships but really how can you know what are the best practices that are out there in order to to blend public and private finance and really make sure that we are kind of creating ways of scaling up and replicating around the world so i think i'll uh, probably leave it uh, with that at the moment but i'm happy to continue discussions either now or like afterwards or by youtube yeah <laughs> thanks a lot barbara i mean i didn't quite expect to get the full answer to the whole question but but uh, i think you actually addressed a very important part of it i mean it's not only for adaptation of course how you can get private sector and private sector finance in but i think the whole resilience argument has had a sort of hard life so far in terms of private sector engagement of course more than, than mitigation but even in mitigation we discussed the same things and the barrier to some extent the same but i'll say much more outspoken here i think you also have to deal with almost changing the mindset of some of the companies to see the business opportunities anyway it wasn't me speaking so Barbara, as I said, has another five minutes. So if you have some uh, questions, comments, you better come with them now. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to be taking the uh, mic again. Well, I'd, I'd, in your in your uh, explanation, you 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 seem to be quite fascinated about this private sector thing quite a lot. And here we're talking about uh, this uh, mostly on the adaptation and how much of the uh, the role that the private sector would actually be, what is your expectation on uh, on the adaptation work because as my experience coming from nepal or from the at least from the less developed countries that their role seems to be really limited when it comes to addressing either flood issues or, or landslides or something something very related to that so well i mean the, the, it, it looks to me that if, if you if you focus too much on private sector probably there will be an opportunity for looking for profit so how does that uh, come to play so i just want a little bit of an explanation on that thank you yeah let's take one more okay getting used to that though <laughs> thank you i'll uh, maybe compliment you this first question i'm nicole dupal from uh, international institute for sustainable development and i think if i did saying who you are Nicole De Paula, so, International Institute for Sustainable Development. Yeah. Sorry, I was fast because I didn't want to take the five <laughs> minutes that we have. Um, you mentioned the use of uh, public resources to finance uh, maybe the better engagement of private sector. If I am, if may, maybe this is not precisely what. So I would like to. Could you develop a little bit on this because, as I said, there's very limited resources from uh, public set, and you don't see how governments can still put it more on, on the private sector. Thank you. Thank you. We have to get, really well have to get used to that. <laughs> yes. Are there any more or we'll go back to Barbara? Ellen. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Okay, Alan Miller, ex IFC. Just just to offer the counterpoint, I think there's a huge amount that public finance can do to leverage private investment that does not amount to subsidizing or in any way paying inappropriate funding. I think it's creating the investment climate. It's uh, creating the regulatory incentives so people don't locate their private business in a coastal area and then get flooded and lose all the jobs. So I, I think that there needs to be a broader discussion in which the opportunities for creative enabling of private investment to promote resilience is given equal weight. I, I agree it's been given very little detail. I don't know how it's treated, Anne, in your report, but I know that Barbara's report is very explicit in that there is a very big difficulty tracking private investment in resilience. And it's, as CPI has said repeatedly, it means there's a big underestimate. Thanks, Ellen. I think in order of time, maybe move over to you, Barbara. Sure. Well, thanks so much. And Ellen actually already kind of provided an initial reply to the questions, which is fully right. We would not, you know, we, you got to under also differentiate between the private sector. It's not that private sector. We work a lot, you know, with like smallholder farmers. We work a lot, you know, trying to see how you can, for example, there is a concrete example, an agricultural supply chain facility that is meant to kind of where the facility which is run through MDBs is meant to basically provide technical assistance to farmers and help them partner with uh, every businesses to really make sure that they can then do 
you know, that they get the credit lines from local financial institutions to make the right investments into their agricultural technologies. So I think there is a lot that can be done. Uh, Ellen also said about, you know, it really the, the role, um, you know, and we work, you know, it, it's a lot um, the, the development finance institutions that work with work in country, national development banks work in country to help create a policy dialogue uh, with, with the government, with stakeholders, with civil society in the country to really make sure that you're creating basically the enabling environment that then can help you, you know, to bring more in of the private sector. Certainly, you know, there, there will always be a, an important public component, but you know, why I'm talking a lot about the private sector is because I want to, you know, win that battle. I want to make sure that we are actually getting on a two degrees pathway. We will not be able to do that if we're not finding you know, effective ways of aligning the available public resources and making, you know, making sure that we're creating the enabling environment in the countries that really bring private sector in it. It's very often, it's actually the domestic private sector. It's not like the international, it's not the, the multinational, it's really kind of the local financial institutions, the banks, it's like you know, micro, it's like a lot of trying to help SMEs in the country to really make the right investment. And in this way also transform the economies. So um, I think it's a good point, but I think it's uh, also in line with what Ellen said, it's not about subsidizing the private sector. It's really about enabling, you know, making the private sector more yeah, comfortable with, with what's going on in a country. And then therefore, you know, enabling the private sector to make these investments. But it's a good point. I'm, I'm happy to share more examples on, on how it can be done. And we're working also on like how to provide insurance, you know, information on insurance that which then helps you to actually improve the, the resilient behavior and make the right investments if you understand what the impacts would be. And so there is a number of different models that are out there and still much more that needs to be done, but I think it's it's really important to work on that. And you know more of that in country, actually. Lim said he had a little additional comment. I think we should take it now instead of waiting for him to come well, in a little later. Before Barbara leaves, if I can just add a little comment on this. Um, so. There's been an estimate of how much funding uh, has come to develop uh, capacity building in developing countries on tackling climate change. And it's in the order of several hundred million dollars or euros. And I would argue that a large part of that has gone from the public sector in the developed countries who are providing the funding to actually the private sector in their own countries, so are consulting companies, private profit-making consulting companies who then parachute in consultants, experts, to, to do a workshop like this, and then they fly out and then they tick the capacity building box and they collect their money. So what has happened? Capacity has been built of private sector companies who are profit making in the country that is giving the money and the recipient country gets very little of that. So at the moment, there's a lot of public to private funding transfers within the giving countries, the Annex One countries, in the name of adaptation technology transfer. Yeah, thanks, Liam. I, it's something we discussed in the Durban Forum also last week. Of, of course, that's happening also. I, I think. Okay. <laughs> if there's any burning questions for Barbara, this is the last chance. <laughs> Otherwise, I mean, sorry to. No, no, no. I mean, at least here, I hope there'll be many other. No, I mean, I just thought one, one thing that struck me because it's an issue that interests me personally a little bit and I'm not on the panel, so I'll just use the fact that I'm on the microphone. Mm -hmm. I think one of the distinctions in my sort of mental way of grappling with it is that, that you talk about adaptation and when Alan talks about it, he talks about resilient development. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's necessarily just the semantics, but it's about, in my view, when you had the discussions here for, and I've been here a long time, I tell you, uh, adaptation is, is like prevention. I mean, you prevent damage or you try to sort of make sure it doesn't get to be too big or whatever. For me, resilient development is how you change the underlying patterns. And I think if you look at new businesses in agriculture, new businesses in water or whatever, you can actually see it as a kind of a green growth, green economy if you want to. I'm sure there'll be winners and losers like in any other transition going on and you need to handle that. But I think you need to get into the sort of resilient development mode and see the opportunities in it to be able to do that shift. But there you need to have the policy framework and all the other things in place to do that. So, so just say, I mean, some of it you can maybe a little bit associate with the different in the semantics about. Good. I think we should move on to the next one. And we didn't really have an order agreed, so now I'll just do one. And I'll ask Madeleine maybe to come and see, say something. Sorry. 
about how it feels to be sort of at the other end of the adaptation gap in a sense, or at least the finance gap, and how you handle it with what you have in terms of resources. You're welcome to answer the overall question also. Thank you, John, and thank you, Anna, for, for inviting Senegal to be part of this uh, panelist, and also to, uh, maybe to, to share with you. I, I just want to also to thank you for this report. I think it's, uh, it's a great uh, instrument for our negotiation on, on adaptation, and I'm sure that uh, many countries will, will, will have a look on that in order to, to inspire our, our, our discussion on adaptation. I, I just want maybe to, 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 to highlight and and say that uh, I think it was really a great uh, 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 outcome from Paris to have uh, agreed together that uh, mitigation and adaptation have to have the same treatment. And I think this was something that will open the door for better investment on, on, on adaptation. Saying that, I, 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 I think adaptation is a challenge for all of us. It's not only for developing countries, but they have a more most vulnerable and they, they have to to, 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 to to tackle that. And I am saying that if we if there is no really clear strategy on how to support the developing country to face to, to respond to their adaptation need, we might have uh, some uh, 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 less responsive from them regarding mitigation because they might deviate all their resources in order to, to consider adaptation need instead of uh, going uh, under mitigation, uh, 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 mitigation contribution. So it's something maybe we we need to to, to think about, because mitigation uh, adaptation is linked to to poverty eradic eradication. If you not uh, uh, respond to this uh, urgent need, even need coming in the uh, uh, middle and the long term, you face a need from. A uh, uh, from government to, 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 to start planning on adaptation. I think we all uh, admit that really there's a key need on planning on adaptation because it's what you are facing directly with your population, with your community, and you have to help them to, 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 re to, to respond. This is, uh, you know, the mandate of policymaker. So saying that, I think we, we, in this process, something was come up, and I think it was really interesting through the agreement and through the decision we do have is uh, to see how we can accompany the process on, 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 on taking on board adequately adaptation. And there was this decision on having a, a, a technical examination process on, on adaptation. And this will start tomorrow with uh, two days uh, workshop. And this will allow, I think, all different uh, stakeholders coming from different uh, various uh, 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 spe uh, specialization to, to discuss how to capture really adaptation, what are the gaps, what are the finance needs, and I am sure that uh, uh, the report from uh, UNEP will be really useful. What are the governance? Because we are talking about enabling environment. What is the government at the national level, at the local level we have to, to establish? Because it's something we have to, to work on, it's something we have to to. to, to to, 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 to challenge, and uh, this is really important. And saying that, there's also the technical paper. I think there's a technical paper that was been asked to, the, to uh, the secretary to facilitate this technical paper, so to give more guidance, and I'm, I'm, I'm just also making a link with your, 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 your report and whatever coming from the discussion we are having here. How useful it can be really to 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 to, to give some argument to give some uh, some clear guidance on how to proceed in particular for the finance point and something that is there is the third point is the summary for policymaker and what i'm saying in this process we have two champions so we have uh, one from uh, france and we have one from morocco so this is the two countries that, uh, that are leading us on this, uh, uh, on the, the Paris Agreement uh, of Regeneration. So I think this is important. So I think taking this um, opportunity, taking this different tool that have been uh, on the table uh, by, through the, the COP, through this uh, uh, agreement, this will make us really considering uh, 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 on a better way, on a better uh, uh, approach, the, the issue of adaptation. 
as I say, in the country level, we, we have we have started, and many countries are starting working on NAPS. Uh, many countries are also starting identifying, and they do it in the INDC, as been said by by by, by Olga. Uh, 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 how 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 to come up? How to better? Uh, 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 um, uh, implement the, the adaptation needs. So this means that is why I, I see this debate really interesting. How to bring national budget, how to bring uh, international support, but also how to create at the national level uh, uh, environment that help us to, to have something sustainable. And to have something sustainable from my point of view is to have domestic is to build some domestic capacity. So this domestic capacity we came from public administration, but from local administration and also from private sector. Is why I am saying that, yeah, we, 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 we need to build this capacity at the local level, at the national level, to bring our private domestic sector to be part on this uh, process of, uh, of adaptation. And uh, there's a lot of example we can uh, we can give. I, I look at the, 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 the vocation of uh, of, uh, of agriculture. We need to diversify our our seed. We need to diversify our crop. So we need to see how we can provide some incentive. How we can bring the private sector to be interesting on this local market, because we are responding to our local need. So this is something I think. Through the uh, climate finance, we, we, we need to think about how we can help each country, depending on his uh, circumstances, to, 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 to have a, 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 a sustainable way to, 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 to respond to his capacity need. I'm sure that we can't no longer build on international finance because, as you say, the demand is increasing. So there is a need really. To, 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 to help country to build capacity, to build uh, domestic uh, capacity, to bring their own private sector to see that they, they have to be engaged. Uh, uh, saying that, I, 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 I will be no longer, but uh, I think, uh, as you say, we need to accompany all these things. So there is a really need what we look from kind of climate finance on adaptation on for, from climate finance uh, in general is how to really help uh, uh, sustain, uh, help accompany country, assist them really to, to, to build this uh, capacity in various areas. The need is, yes, it's important. We, we have also to increase knowledge. We have to have uh, really both uh, information, better information, accurate information, but I think it's why we are all here. So we, we are here to, to accompany country, to, to implement the INDC, but also to, to help them to, 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 to make it on the sustainable way. This is my work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madeleine. I forgot to say who you are, but I think you've been around not as long as me, but for quite some time. And, and of course, Madeleine is from Senegal, where she hits the climate change work. And uh, we've had the pleasure of working on a lot of different things over the years and still do so. But when, uh, I would hope somebody to solve that problem because it's, it's really annoying and we can all hear it. It's just because as long as all four doors are closed, we have this sort of summing sound. If just mm -hmm. one of them is open, then it goes away. So I don't know if anybody has the technical expertise to put a bucket or something in the way. Because, <laughs> yeah, I think they're trying. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. Good, but you're working on the solution. Good, perfect. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it annoys everybody because it's it's a really frustrating sound. Thanks a lot. Good, did anybody have any questions directly to Madeleine? Otherwise, we will take the last two of the panel and then have hopefully a little bit time left for additional questions and answers towards the end. So no immediate one. So we take the other ones and I think Salim. Okay. I don't, I've got this sort of huge thing I don't can worry. read about you, but don't I think worry. you all know Salim. I mean, he's maybe right now the International Center of Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh is maybe sort of the main place. And he was also on the steering committee for the report when we did the first one. And uh, yes, yeah, Salim, I, mean, I think he's one of the most known figures in adaptation. So please go ahead and give us your estimate. Of thank, the thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. 
Um, so um, let me just share a little bit of my uh, experience with the Adaptation Fund, uh, Adaptation Gap Report from the first report onwards, and then share some thoughts on where I feel we might want to go uh, in future. Uh, the first one was when I was initially invited to be on the steering committee, I think it was of the first uh, Adaptation Gap Report, I was one of the skeptics. Uh, I didn't feel that uh, adaptation lent itself to doing the same thing that the mitigation gap report <laughs> was able to do very effectively over the years, uh, which is have a single metric for uh, assessing a gap. Uh, in the adaptation field, we don't have such a thing. Uh, but I must say that in the end, I was uh, very impressed by the product that the, the authors came out with. It became very useful in discussing a complex subject, didn't have a single metric, didn't have a one size fit all uh, um, uh, aspect to it, but it did bring out the complexities involved in adaptation. It, it served, in my view, a very significant purpose in uh, educating those who are not involved in the adaptation field about the complexities of the adaptation arena and, and why it needed to be treated differently and, and uh, its importance. So it was extremely effective. Um, with regard to the second report, I think this is where we start getting into a metric that is applicable across uh, different adaptations, namely money. How much is it going to cost? Uh, what are the estimates of cost now, estimates of cost projected into the future? And as the authors have done very well, and as Barbara has also mentioned, they've done valiant attempts. All of these are obviously uh, somewhat uh, uh, speculative uh, um, estimations, but nevertheless, extremely important that we do them. And my view on them, I was in a side event here uh, um, a few days ago, and somebody asked me, I think it was you who asked the question on, on the costs of, <laughs> of uh, adaptation. And I said, even if it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars, it's still many orders of magnitude cheaper than not taking action. The costs of inaction are in the trillions, not in the billions, in the trillions. They are several orders of magnitude bigger than the cost of adaptation. So whatever the cost of adaptation is, pick your figure, 100 billion, 200 billion, 500 billion, it's still cheaper than not taking action. And so that's the most important issue or comparison in my mind with regard to the cost of adaptation. Now, let me share a little bit about my own particular interest in the field of adaptation and some thoughts for consideration uh, for future adaptation gap reports, perhaps. Um, I, I work in the field of adaptation, particularly working with vulnerable countries in the UNFCC context. That's the most uh, vulnerable countries being the least developed countries, along with small island states and, and countries in Africa. But more importantly, on the ground, working with vulnerable communities. And for the last 12 years, I've been organizing an event called the International Conference on Community-Based Adaptation. Uh, we just had the last one uh, a few weeks ago in Bangladesh, where we had nearly 200 international participants uh, come. And what we do there is a seven day long event where the first three days, we take all the international participants in groups of about 20, and they go and spend two nights living with a vulnerable community, seeing how they're tackling it, dealing with it, and then they come back to the capital and we have another four days of more traditional conference, although even there we try and be innovative. We don't allow PowerPoint presentations, for example. It's highly interactive and we discuss issues and, and try and come up with ideas. A um, couple of years ago, last year we held it in Kenya. We had a very good uh, 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 event in, in Nairobi, focusing on how to measure adaptation. And I can see a few people in the audience here who were there. But the year before that, and that's the one I want to mention, we held it in Nepal, in Kathmandu. And the focus of that particular uh, conference, it was the eighth uh, CBA conference, was on adaptation finance. And we came out with what we call the Kathmandu Declaration, which had three advocacy demands. The first advocacy demand was to the global uh, funding community, anybody who is funding adaptation or climate change at the global level, uh, the advocacy demand was that at least half of the money, 50%, should go for adaptation. At that point in time, the ratio was 84% mitigation and 16% adaptation. It hasn't improved a lot since then, 
but it's something that we have been pushing for. In fact, uh, several of our members who participated in the conference, I think Raju, you were one of them, went to the GCF board meeting that took place a few days later, presented this demand there, and, and we're very pleased to see that at least the GCF board has made a decision uh, to allocate 50% of their funding uh, to adaptation, which we think is a correct decision. Um, the second demand that we had made out of that conference was that any money that's allocated for adaptation to climate change, whether it be at the global level or the national level, and this is meant primarily to national governments, at least 50% of that should be allocated to the most vulnerable communities in their own countries. And we chose Nepal for a particular reason for that particular meeting, because in Nepal, the government of Nepal has actually made a policy decision to allocate not just 50%, but 80% of their funding to the local level. And they have done a very innovative uh, local level planning exercise called the LAPA, a local adaptation plan of action at the Panchayat level, which the local, gov local governments and local communities produce their plan. And then the national government gives them the resources, the budgets to implement those plans. And uh, even though this is not a perfect system and there are some lapses, and I know that they're doing an evaluation at the moment, nevertheless, it is the right thing to do. Uh, empower local communities to be able to take care of what they can themselves. Local communities cannot do everything, but they can do a lot if they can be empowered and enabled. And then the third and final demand was for anybody who is funding uh, climate change activities, be they adaptation or mitigation, but particularly for adaptation, they need to report back on how much of their money is actually going to the most vulnerable communities. And at that point in time, and I think this may well be still true, none of them can tell us that. They tell us they're giving so much money here and so much money there. The other day there was a, a, a side event here in, in Bonn on the G7 initiative to uh, provide insurance for 400 million people. And the German representative gave us a list of programs that they're doing. And I said, where are these 400 million people? And they don't know. They're giving a lot of it's indirect coverage of insurance through various government schemes and private sector schemes. But they're not tracking who's getting the money. They can, you know. Ask um, Zuckerberg of Facebook. He's got 1.6 billion people's names, addresses, details. He can do it. Why can't the German government track 400 million people? So there isn't the incentive to do it. What I want is to have that incentive. Can we now track the next adaptation gap is of roughly half a billion vulnerable people on planet Earth? how much of them are receiving any kind of adaptation assistance. To me, that's a big gap. I'd like somebody to try and fill that gap. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salim, for sharing your usual mm -hmm. insights and, and wisdom, I'd say, and uh, also for putting it in perspective in, in a somewhat different way on what finance gap is and how we distribute it. I think to be fair to everybody and to give Olga as the last one sufficient time, I think we'll go straight on to her and then whatever we have got left, we can deal with in terms of questions and answers. So Olga, I guess you're going to take a little bit back in the convention or whatever, but I'll leave that to you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, when uh, you introduced me and I also forgot to mention that I have, I'm not the financial expert and not expert in the finance of adaptation. Um, but what I would like to speak about and try to respond to this question, how to implement the Paris Agreement, uh, to build a little bit on what uh, Madeleine started speaking and uh, try to, uh, to look uh, together with you as what are the provisions of, of, of what has been decided in Paris and why they would be helping adaptation actually and how would they help also the financing for, for adaptation. And the first one that I already mentioned in the beginning is that um, the, the Paris Agreement links the adaptation efforts with the two degrees uh, global goal. Uh, two degrees or well below two degrees, be very um, exact, as our executive secretary, uh, secretary is always uh, was highlighting that it should be 1.5 aspirational goal and the two guaranteed. 
So why it's so good news for adaptation? I personally still remember when in Kazakhstan, when I was in the climate change team, we were developing climate change scenarios and trying to, and Salim was aware about that, he was in Kazakhstan at the time, and trying to make a case that we need to think seriously about adaptation and then to talk to politicians. And then you come up with the scenarios, which is a uh, equilibrium using equilibrium models and then if it has a double concentration in the atmosphere then you have a full range of different scenarios and up to from from three degrees up and uh, no precipitation to two degrees or one degree and uh, lots of precipitation and then you don't really not you're not convincing now all countries in the world i mean all the uh, that uh, signed the paris agreement say that we are we have a two degrees as a, as a temperature as a goal as a temperature limit and you um that, that that provides for everyone at all levels governments business um stakeholders uh, local government some good um, um orientation and direction what they need to be prepared for and what they what they need to submit to their uh, to their financial um, entities and to their uh, governments as well for uh, as the as the target for adaptation this is one. Second, the Paris Agreement is an opportunity to strengthen INDCs and turn them from the INDCs intention, intended national contribution to NDCs, to something, something that we they are going to implement. And this is providing for um, opportunity to present to the, to the international community and to the financial community and donors their uh, plans or their, their uh, determination for the transparent process that they establishing at the national level and at all levels to um, to tackle or to to uh, to to adapt to climate change um, related to that is that uh, the Paris agreement requested or the COP requested the GCF uh, to expedite support for national adaptation plans so and this is very um strong request is actually the paragraph in the in the decision one cp um that that says that and this presents developing country with the very valuable opportunity to come up with this national plans to identify the programs and uh what was it programs and projects which are also specified in the decision and uh, to uh, uh, to to request and to seek to seek support for the formulation of this national adaptation plan. This is the the, the, the uh, legitimate and transparent process that I was talking about when we, we talked about the indices and the two degrees. Um, also, um, the Paris Agreement um, goes a, a level down from 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 the governments, and Madeleine already mentioned because the adaptation committee is preparing for this. Uh, technical um, expert process for uh, for adaptation that would provide um, um, ample opportunity to share lessons and to to raise the profile of adaptation to raise the good practices for adaptation so information is a, uh, is a lot so it's providing um, um, providing the opportunity the Paris agreement providing the opportunity for everyone to cooperate that um, stakeholders now also recognizes the very uh, very um, active um, very active uh, participants in, in 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 the adaptation and they um, have their platform and through nasca they have an opportunity to present their actions and to to share with everyone interested and to exchange the um, the knowledge and adaptation and finally, um, I would like to um, conclude with what what Paris um, Agreement uh, started in its adaptation article is that to recall that it's established the adaptation goal, which I will read the goal that of enhancing adaptive capacity, strengthening resilience and reducing vulnerability to climate change with a view of contributing to the sustainable development and ensuring an adequate adaptation response in the context of the temperature war. So, as I mentioned in the in the beginning, in, in my opening remark, um, this um, this adaptation goal will be assessed or will be uh, will be considered. The state, uh, uh, stock will be taken in 2023 
to to look at how or what is the uh, how what is the progress on achieving this adaptation goal and with this regard we um the um COP gave uh, several important methodological tasks to uh, to adaptation committee and to uh, um, to, to parties um, to come up with some methodologies that would help to make this assessment. As as we say, uh, as Salim said, Salim said, um, we don't have a, a single metrics to assess this progress, and which is um, um, difficult to come up with with one but we need to to approach this task and the task was given to adaptation committee to develop methodologies to recognize adaptation efforts and input from gap report and maybe from from the future gap reports on how to track domestic um, adaptation resources of developing countries uh, can be very valuable in this regard the second task that was given to um, in, with, in, in relation to the input of the global stock take on assessing the global adaptation goal is the review of adequacy and effectiveness of adaptation and support. <laughs> this is extremely difficult and challenging task. And um, this is uh, the, the linkage here, uh, which, I, which I've seen is the input from the gap report on what is provided in terms of finance and, and what is needed, um, any future work on adaptation gaps, adaptation ongoing, and what is needed for 1.5 degrees, what is needed for, for two degrees. And finally, to uh, the, the, the methodologies to, and steps to facilitate mobilization of support. And here's the UNEP, UNEP's work on private sector and what Barbara was saying, because to, um, also uh, would come in handy. So this is, um, in a nutshell, what I wanted to, to say, and I'm happy to respond to any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga, for taking us, you could say, back to sort of the framing question of the convention and, and what we're doing here, and also to see how the GAP report fits into that context. So I think let's, we have still five, ten minutes left, so let's see if there's some questions out to the panelists or maybe sort of more comments on on the way we frame it i think it ought to be interesting to know for for us and certainly the way you link it over into the decision making processes i mean what what is the utility of this and if we continue doing it what would be interesting to sort of look at in addition and so on so both questions comments would be most welcome so if anybody has the guts to start up and catch again so if somebody don't mind throwing so it's just the mic is there, that's... Yeah, thanks. Hello, Julia Grimm from German Watch. Um, I have a question, I think probably to Anne. <laughs> um, does, or we also heard from Madeleine and um, other developing countries that a lot of developing countries actually have a lot of problems of actually assessing their adaptation needs. They lack um, um, technology capacities and also financial needs for, for actually getting information and data to assess their adaptation needs. So I would be interested if the report only touches upon the financial needs for actually uh, adaptation action, <laughs> or if also those needs for assessing adaptation needs are included because I think that would probably sum up to a, a bigger amount of money. Thanks. So if you don't mind passing back, Bonnie, two rows back. Thank you. First of all, thank you for this report. Uh, I mean, this... Even if they know you, should say who you are. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm... Some people know me. Um, I am Bonnie Biagini. I'm with UNDP. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you for the report. It's very useful, it's very important. I've seen in the literature a lot of confusion between what adaptation financing is and cost recovery post-disaster uh, is. So, I mean, 
uh, needed uh, to be explained, to be specified more and more. So thank you. I, I just wanted to, um, to give you an example, especially after the last question, um, of um, financing for adaptation use and gaps, um, especially with respect to least developed countries in Africa. Uh, there is this issue that they don't have the data. So even quantify what is the, the adaptation gap in the financing sector is, is still approximate because if you don't have the data if you don't know the risk in some detail how can you know exactly what your you know what your adaptation needs will be so obviously uh, the impacts are so significant that an, an estimate can be done however the lack of data is adamant as a need for um, developing countries overall in particular ldcs in africa so what we have seen is that um, the technologies are often misused or the data are not digitized there's no uh, there's no history there's no early warnings because if you don't have the data you, you cannot tell in time people how to run away from a disaster etc so there there has been a lot of financing on that but the technologies have been very expensive and there is now a new uh, generation of technologies that are less expensive uh, but can be extremely helpful. And also there is the private sector involvement. You can ask phone companies to work on that because before it was mentioned how the private sector could help on adaptation. This is a concrete example in which financing for the technologies and the capacity because the technology alone is not sufficient. And then uh, inform the policymakers and also the small farmers or the vulnerable communities through the data can be a, use, a good use of public financing as well as stimulating the, the um, uh, participation of the private sector. And uh, just, just to be not self-serving at all, we have a side event tomorrow at 6.30 with young hackers, with young it's hackers wrong. in this room from Africa who will show you apps that can be used uh, in the phones by farmers in Africa. So if you're interested in this, we can keep talking. But I think this was also relevant to this discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bonnie. Well, yeah, so I encourage everybody who can to come back tomorrow <laughs> and enjoy both that one and the presentation and everything else. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think maybe because of time, maybe we can take a quick round throughout the panel. I think maybe in addition, I, I was kind of tempted a little bit myself also, but it has to some extent been asked already. But but what we talked about in the MRV partnership dinner last night is that I mean, with the NDC implementation, you actually make the indices into national development plans. So, so in the end, I mean, how, how do you actually then separate out what's additional and what's, I mean, finance for this? And, I mean, I don't know if you get the point, but I mean, the more you integrate it, the, the more difficult it becomes to talk about climate finance, development finance, because in the end, it will become finance for development that's more resilient. And then I don't know if the additionality of that, but anyway, I mean, it's, it's just something I'm thinking about. I don't know if you want to start, Anne. Thank you, John. I'll be happy to. I think if you ask people on the ground, they don't care, you know, whether it's earmarked for <laughs> finance, for adaptation or for development. The, the real um, issue is whether it helps people on the ground to adapt to climate change. So going back to Julia's question about the challenges uh, that that many countries are facing, not not just developing countries, even developed countries are facing in, in um, formalizing and, and really analyzing and assessing their adaptation needs. That is a huge issue. I think it's it's really it comes out very clearly from the INDCs, and and I think that's also the follow up and on the NDC process and on the, making the Paris Agreement operational in terms of implementing adaptation measures is is where we can really help hopefully support countries in in becoming more accurate and more precise on on their adaptation needs and how to address them. The the cost estimates in the report we're looking at all the studies we could find basically so some of them do cover implementation aspects and costs and and policy conditions and lack of frameworks and capacity building and some don't so it, it's it's basically it, it's it varies between the 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 studies so we can't really say that the low level is because they don't include those aspects in that but we do see that costs tend to increase the more we include um, realistic assumptions about capacity about implementation and, and current policies but there are so many other factors and especially you know the degree to which sectoral and risk coverage is is 
is comprehensive that also affects the, the numbers. So you can't directly say one or the other. I guess that's it. Sam, do you want to come in again? Or? Oh. <laughs> final remark. Yeah, just my final remark. I, 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 I just also want to maybe to thank you, but 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 just to highlight the, the someone was saying about the, uh, the kind of stimulation. I, I think what we're looking from climate finance is uh, just to to simulate uh, something happening at the, the national level. And I do think that the GCF role is uh, to play these roles because we 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 can admit that. GCF can try to, to, to help countries because this is a learning process by doing so. Having some project on the ground, starting them will also create some capacity. And I think sometimes it's really good to have something on the ground because it's where people people are, are learning a, a lot. So we, we, we're just looking GC, GCF to play this role. And also regarding the, the mainstreaming aspect you're talking about, uh, as I say, we, 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 the national budget is not only dedicated to climate change; it's, it's for other purpose. So, what we're looking is how 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 to 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 allow at the national level to participate to this the activities related to climate change, but also how to to how to combine different sources of funding to, 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 to respond to, to climate needs. So this is how we, we see this measuring aspect. And the NAPS will help us on, 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 on making things more clear and planning and having more idea on how the different combination of sources will be, will be developed at the national level. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene, Olga. You want to go first? Uh, no? um, I didn't support any specific question to, no, to leave, but fine. maybe with regard to the assessing of needs, I would come back again to the or to the national adaptation plans and uh, say that this is uh, the the guidelines that, that the international process is giving on how to develop these plans would, would greatly help in approaching this very complex uh, task as well. Thanks. Salim, final words of wisdom. Sure. Uh, let me let me just share some thoughts on uh, where you might want to think about future assessments. Um, one of the areas in which um, my research team is trying to develop uh, further insights is in the notion of adaptive capacity, and in particular the inputs into adaptive capacity based on knowledge. So the input is knowledge about an issue, climate change, its risks and potential adaptation. And the output is empowerment of the people who acquired the knowledge. And this can be scaled. You can scale it at an individual, a household, a village, a community, a city, a country, and I would argue you could probably scale it to the whole world. And so you might think about, are the 7 billion people on the planet sufficiently knowledgeable about climate change to be able to adapt to it effectively, or insufficiently knowledgeable? And what is that knowledge gap across the world, a global knowledge gap on the issue of climate change? And I would argue that going forward, every single human being on the planet needs to have some knowledge about climate change and some knowledge about adaptation. And part of that knowledge gap, a part of the adaptation gap, is knowledge in itself. And how can we then measure that? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that's a good point to end on for sort of food for further work and thought. And uh, before we end, maybe if I can ask you to give a final hand for the panelists, I think we've been managing to... <laughs> been managing to keep most of you in the room. <laughs> and uh, actually been pretty good at catching because some of, last time somebody lost the thing and got really worried about it but uh, it actually works fine but thank you for coming and thank you for many interesting